Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at KFUO.org. Good afternoon and welcome to Concord Matters here on Worldwide KFUO, the messenger of good news. We are coming to you live on this Tuesday afternoon, May 15th, from our studios at the International Center of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in St. Louis, Missouri, or as I call St. Louis, Habitat for Humidity. Uh, we just skipped right over spring. We've gone from February to July here, but uh, that's better than being 20 degrees below normal. I am your host for this program. I am Pastor Charles Henriksen. I am the pastor of St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Bon Terre, Missouri. If you'd like to know more about our church, you can go to our website, stmatthewbt.org. And we have services every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and Bible class right after that. So we'd be happy to have you join us. We're about 40 minutes south of St. Louis. Uh, We invite you to join us in this program today. You can participate with your comments or questions. We have a toll-free number all across North America. That number is 800-730-2727. Again, 800-730-2727. 2727. Locally here in St. Louis, the area code is 314-821-0850. Again, our local number, area code 314-821-0850. You can also send us your comments or questions at our email address, which is kfuo at kfuo.org. We have two guests in the studio here with us today, two brother pastors from the St. Louis area, and immediately to my right, uh, at least uh, in seating arrangement, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, Pastor Mark Sell, the pastor of Our Savior in Fenton, Missouri. Welcome, Mark. Well, good afternoon. I'm Mark Sell, uh, pastor of Our Savior Lutheran Church. That's Our Savior LCS dot org. And uh, we've got uh, everything from a two-year-old daycare all the way up through eighth grade. So you've got a school as well as a church? Yes, we do. Very good. And uh, so uh, what time are your Sunday services there? Well, we have a Saturday night service at 5 and then 8 and 10.30 on Sunday mornings. We have a uh, Wednesday night Bible study that's taught by Dr. Kevin Armbrust. Okay. And wonderful service and, of course, a wonderful Bible study. Quite a, quite a great teacher, that man is. Mm-hmm. And he also teaches the Sunday morning Bible study. All right. And uh, Fenton is located in the southern uh, regions of St. Louis County. Yeah, south- wait, southwest corner, so to speak, of St. Louis. Very good. Yep. All right. And then immediately to his right is Pastor Kevin Golden, the pastor of Village Lutheran Church in uh, Ledoux. And he is the pastor of the Village People. <laughs> Welcome, yes, <Kevin. laughs> uh, very good to be with you. Uh, and the villagers uh, send me along with uh, <laughs> with greetings. Yeah, in fact, one of your uh, at least one of your uh, parishioners uh, works in this building sometimes. Right, right. And I have a number of <laughs> your members assistant who pastor. do. But the assistant pastor, yes, is uh, Pastor uh, Harrison, uh, president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Good, welcome. And where can people find out more about Village Lutheran Church on Clayton Road in Ladue? Uh, VillageLutheranChurch.org is our uh, email or our web address. And what are the service times there? 8, 15, 10, 45 on Sunday morning, 930 for Sunday school and Bible study. Very good, very good. All right. Well, today, uh, listeners, we're going to be advancing in the Book of Concord, believe it or not. Uh, We've gone from Article 12A on repentance, and today we're going to enter Article 12B on confession and satisfaction. I want to start off our program today with a little true or false quiz on this uh, matter of confession. So if you're playing at home, if you got a little piece of scrap paper, note paper, you can jot this down. If you're driving in your car, you can make mental notes as you pay attention to the road. And so I'm going to I'm going to read off eight statements and you tell me true or false. I'm going to ask our pastors to hold off here because we're going to get to all these things in our discussion today. So here are eight statements about confession 
And is it is this statement true or false? Number one, Lutherans got rid of confession. One is Lutherans got rid of confession, true or false. Number two, the confession of sins that we do at the start of the service in our Lutheran churches, the confession of sins we do at the start of the service is the same thing, the same setting as what is spoken of as confession in the Book of Concord, true or false. Number three, most LCMS church members have probably never gone to private confession. Number four. Can we at least laugh? Uh, what do you, well, we'll, oh, no, we'll no, get no, to this. I'm I want to read all eight, and then I I'm going to ask myself, you, Charlie. I'll ask you guys what you think about these. Okay. So uh, let me first read these. Um, number four. Pastors have the authority to forgive sins. Number five. Private confession is too Catholic and thus is a bad thing. Number six. Private confession ought to be required of all church members. Number seven, you have to name all the sins you have committed in order to be forgiven. And number eight, you need to work off your sins by how you live and what you do after confession. Now I'm going to ask these boys here in the studio what they, what they think about these true or false statements and see if they uh, come to an agreement. Number one, Lutherans got rid of confession. Who wants to go first? I'll go, and I would say, no, that's false. We did not get rid of confession. Uh, we did strip it of the abuses and uh, things that have been glommed onto it, but confession is still very much a practice. All right. Pass- it's a biblical practice, so therefore it's our practice as well. All right, I agree with you. That statement is false. Lutherans did not get rid of confession. Number two, Pastor Sell. The confession of sins that we do at the start of the service is the same setting as what is spoken of in the Book of Concord. True or false? Uh, false. How so? Well, if if I remember correctly, it is the difference between private confession and public confession, okay. the general confession. And what takes place at the beginning of the divine service is a general confession that we all kind of speak it together. So mm-hmm. in that sense, we do continue with confession, but it is not uh, the understanding that was in practice, which would be the private confession and absolution. So when when the Book of Concord talks about confession, it is envisioning private confession. Correct. That's what I would say. Number three, Pastor Golden, or actually Pastor Sell, you wanted to laugh about this one, so I'll let you take this one. (laughs) He's laughing already. Most LCMS church members have probably never gone to private confession. I think that's true. I agree with you. I think that's true. And Golden is nodding his head. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Unfortunate. It's It's tragic, but... Why do Why do you think that's never... Why do you think that most LCMS church members have never gone to private confession? Well, this comes up in one of your later true or false questions, but I think some will say, well, that's a Catholic thing. Too Catholic. Yeah. Right. As a matter of fact, in our Utah circuit, we began private confession and absolution just for the clergy. Mm -hmm. And we had about 15, 16 uh, members of the Utah circuit. And there were only two people who participated in private and confession and absolution. And that was among the clergy. Yeah. And um, and I know I would talk about it quite a bit at my congregation, but boy, it was it it's was a, a ta- it can be it a little taboo. scary. I think Very, it can be a little right. scary. And the first the, time, I believe it's rather scary. I think uh, after somebody, because I, I can certainly say individuals have said to me, Pastor, I've never done this before. This is kind of scary. And after they actually go through it, they'll say. That was actually quite beneficial. That was not scary. That yeah. was liberating. But also, uh, it can be scary no matter how many times you've done it when you're recognizing you're facing the reality of your sin. Now, that fear is overcome by the absolution, uh, the peace that we have via Christ. But still, that can be intimidating. And, it, and as we have time, maybe at the end, we'll talk about why people are a little scared of it and what we can do to encourage private confession in a good way. And maybe we have some resources in our church that can help. And I with think that. a lot of that has to do with people are um, people also have the feeling of I don't really want pastor to know that I thought about that sin. He, yeah, he yeah. will that think differently of me once he finds out. Exactly. And actually, that could go either way. You might think, well, the pastor is going to have a negative view of me if I confess I have this lustful thought or whatever. Or on the other hand, you might say, well, look, I'm going to private confession. He's going to think I'm a great 
Lutheran now. Right, right. And uh, what I will tell individuals who make those kinds of comments is, I will think the same of you afterward as what I did beforehand. Beforehand, I knew you were a sinner forgiven for the sake of Christ. And afterward, what do I know? You're a sinner forgiven for the sake of Christ. And I also tell the people, my ears are a graveyard where those things are buried. I don't take them out of the confessional Correct. to affect my relationship with you. Yes. All right. Number four. Pastors, and I've gotten flack on this one from some visitors sometimes. Pastors have the authority to forgive sins. Yes. True or false? True. 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 Golden. Yeah, and I especially love this. This is a rather critical question within our right for private confession absolution is the pastor asks, do you believe that my forgiveness is Christ's forgiveness? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. And that's a critical question because if all you're getting is Kevin's forgiveness... Well, yeah, you know, that's kind of nice, but it doesn't do you any eternal good. It cannot bring you peace. It cannot uh, give any balm to a burdened conscience. It cannot set you free and cleanse you. But because I do speak Christ's forgiveness by his authority, now you have all that goodness. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you, mm. the pastor says. Yes. all your sin. And, and you'll get visitors from... Um, uh, more generic American Protestant churches who I've even had this once or twice come to me afterwards and say, how can you forgive sins? You can't forgive sins. Because yeah. Christ says so. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, John 20 is one of our foundational yeah. texts for this where uh, the risen Christ appears to his uh, apostles and tells them this very thing. Whatever you uh, forgive is forgiven. Whatever you bind is bound. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so. no, I, that was a common... Um, comment that would come from people, especially when they weren't familiar with Lutheranism or, you know, they were visiting and they didn't come from a, a strong setting, let's say, is that I still have problems with the pastor being able to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And uh, and it's amazing how often pastors have that quick conversation after church when someone says, only God can forgive sins. You can't forgive well, sins. Well, that's and true, but he's authorized. Exactly. It's like exactly. if a king has an ambassador to act in his stead, Yes, the ambassador is fully authorized to act in the name of that king. Yeah, and only God can create life, and how does he choose to do it? Through human instruments. Through humans, yeah, yeah, yeah. a mother and a father. And yeah. so this is how he brings about life. Same also when he uh, gives life-renewing absolution. Well, it's he uses a human instrument to It's do not it. to pump up the pastor. It's so that you can get yeah. the forgiveness delivered to you and on, on good authority. Right. Literally. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Next question. Next true or false statement. And I think you probably can figure out the answer to this one. Private confession is too Catholic and thus is a bad thing. True or false? Well, what do you mean by the word Catholic? <laughs> too yeah. Catholic. Yeah, too Catholic as in too Roman Catholic or something. Yeah, that's false. Yeah. It's not a uh, Roman... Ca now, Roman Catholicism has its own practices that uh, are kind of, if you will, glommed right. on to the practice of private confession absolution. And that we have dispensed with, that we won't do. And so, well, I'm going to get ahead to a future question, but as far as no penance is going to yeah, be yeah. assigned, etc. Yeah, it's interesting to... Uh, think through the culture of your congregation. Some of the older to, folks that grew up with this, we can't be too Catholic, right? Oh, right. exactly. Um, so I know, you know, in a couple congregations here in the St. Louis area, just bringing back the chalice was a Catholic issue. Yes. Or chanting yeah. or making the sign um, of the then, cross. Right. Things that are crucifix. not bad, they're actually good things. Yes. Well, and uh, for some of our older members, though, also, they will remember um, if you were going to receive the Lord's Supper, what'd you have to do? Announce to the pastor right. you know, the night before or at some uh, determined time. And some of my members will tell me, yeah, they would remember that would often involve then a bit of private confession. And that and absolution can be a good pastor. practice, actually. It can be a good practice. Now, um, well, again, this will be partly what's coming up mm -hmm. in another question, but uh, it becomes problematic if, if we require certain things that uh, Scripture itself mm -hmm. does not require. So my next three statements are about what is too Catholic in the wrong sense. In other words, the abuses that kept crept into confession in the Roman Church. So these next three are all of the same type, uh, and I'll just read all three of them. Private confession ought to be required of all church members. Uh, number seven, 
you have to name all the sins you have committed in order to be forgiven. And number eight, you need to work off your sins by how you live and what you do after confession. Mm -hmm. Those three, obviously, are all false. These are the three particular abuses that are corrected if you read the brief exhortation yes. to confession. Yes, and that's uh, in the brief exhortation to confession, written by Luther, often included as part of the large catechism, though technically it's not part of it. Um, nevertheless, there, he one of his chief concerns is... We got rid of all the abuses, and so what are you guys doing? Fall in the ditch on the other side. Yeah, you side. fall in the ditch on the other side. You completely abandon it. And so he's exhorting them, make use of the gift that's present here. You're not required to, but why do you? Why pass up such a blessed gift? And so one of my favorite little Luther quotes is found therein. When I urge you to go to confession, I'm simply urging you to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. This is what a Christian does. A Christian confesses their sins and receives Christ's absolution. So these, these three abuses that were corrected in the Lutheran Church from the Roman Catholic practice of penance, uh, I've paraphrased here, and they are as follows. One, that it was mandatory. Two, the, what is called the enumeration of sins, which gets in today's uh, material. And three is uh, works of satisfaction. And we're going to get into those. But those were the three abuses that were corrected in the practice of confession uh, in the 1520s in the Lutheran Church. All right, so now we're going to actually get into some Book of Concord material here. And uh, this is Article 12b, which is uh, can be seen just a continuation of 12a, which was on repentance. And um, uh, let me just start with uh, paragraph 1 here. We're using the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions. And uh, uh, Article 12b, Confession and Satisfaction... And I'll read paragraph one. Good people can easily conclude that it is very important that the true doctrine be preserved about the above-mentioned parts, contrition and faith. Therefore, we have always been busier with making these topics clear and have argued nothing as yet about confession and satisfaction. What is Melanchthon alluding to here? He says... Uh, uh, in the previous section, he's talked about contrition and faith, and he hasn't touched much yet on confession and satisfaction. Um, how did the Lutherans view repentance? How many parts do they view as repentance compared to the Roman Catholic Church? And what parts did the Lutherans say are essential to repentance? And what parts did the Roman Catholic Church say were essential to repentance. They're both alluded to here. Right. And here you do have the definition, a Lutheran definition of what is true repentance. Two things, contrition, uh, in other words, sorrow for the sin. And second, um, faith, faith that trusts that in Christ I have the full forgiveness of my sin. So with those are the two things that make up true repentance. And what did the Roman Catholic Church have instead, Pastor So? Well, they added the... Uh the whole idea that I've got to make up for my sins now. The satisfaction. The satisfaction, correct. And and so that's why you get into the whole thing of, well, how many Our Fathers do I have to do then? Yeah. How many Hail Marys? Mm -hmm. uh, what else do I have to do in the church? How much, how big does my check need to be for this yeah. sin? And they said um, almost nothing about faith. Mm -hmm. Correct. Or about the forgiveness. And so the Lutherans were saying two parts to essential parts to repentance, contrition, sorrow over sin, and faith, trust in God's promise of forgiveness. The Roman Church was saying three things, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Contrition, sorrow over sin, and it better be true sorrow over sin, not just you're sorry you got caught. <laughs> um, and then the confession was just the work of going to penance, doing it, um, apart from whether there's faith involved. And then satisfaction, working off... Well, yeah, the priest will give you eternal forgiveness, but you've got to work off your temporal punishments that you'd have to pay in uh, so, in purgatory, or you're saying, like, write a check or something. Well, or actually, I'm uh, drawing a line that connects all three of yeah. those items, because the thing that connects them all is me. This is all about what, what i gotta I got to go do, uh, rather than a focus upon true repentance focuses on Christ, what he has done, and therefore the the certainty I have about my forgiveness in Christ. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes up often is, well, how sorry do I have to be? Um, I, I state that crudely, but you could tell when someone's struggling with their sin, 
someone who's repentant also deals with, yeah, but how sorry do I have to be? Mm-hmm. How repentant do I have to be for this? I mean, no, this was a big one, Pastor. This was a big one, so I've got to be even more sorry for it. Mm-hmm. Do you know how do we do? How would you guys answer a parishioner who comes to you with that kind of a kind of a thought in their head that I'm not sure I'm sorry enough? So, may, might I use an anecdote? By all means. And uh, you know, as Pastor uh, Her- uh, Henriksen said, we don't. Uh, you once... almost got elevated. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Pastor Henriksen uh, mentioned that. Hey, when uh, sins are confessed to us, they go in the ear, and that becomes the grave, the tomb in which they are sealed, so they don't get aired. But I can air my own sins. So here we go. All right. So I, I will use this often in teaching on this point that I recall in my life I have been other than. I have an older brother, you know, brothers will fight and such. But mm-hmm. outside of my brother, I've only been in one physical art- altercation in my life. I was about 10 years old and a neighborhood boy. We were playing baseball, a bunch of us kids, and uh, he insulted my mother. And so what did I do? Them's fighting words. Yes, them's <laughs> fighting words. So uh, I got in my licks on him and such. He was also, um, yeah, he was one. I never really cared for him. He was a bit of a loud mouth yeah. and such. So when we got home, my brother was playing this game as well. When we got home my brother ratted me out and told my mom that i've been in this fight and my mother you know i knew exactly she would not be happy with me and so um i told her i was sorry and such and what i recall is this on one hand i didn't feel bad if you will because i enjoyed getting my licks in (laughs) on that kid Uh, i didn't feel bad but on the other hand i knew that what i did was wrong I knew that I had violated what my parents had taught me. I knew that I had violated what God uh, would call upon me to do in such a situation. I knew that it was sin. So I had sorrow that I had sinned. I confessed it as such. And uh, apart from my feelings, all right, I knew I confessed it as sin. So on one hand, I don't want us to make make us overly dependent upon our feelings Mm -hmm. or my feelings uh, deep enough or sorrowful enough. All right. I because think a recognition that you've broken God's commandments yes. and hurt other people. That's it right there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I think a lot of times what is being said by that kind of a statement is, is really the latter. But I, this concern about, well, there really isn't forgiveness for this one. And, and a lot of times I will then emphasize, I will even say this, which in the context will kind of make sense. At that point, when I see someone who's been struggling with their sin and they're not sure they're sorry enough and God couldn't possibly forgive me and and I just declare the gospel to them and make it clear, well, I don't care how sorry you think you are. I'm mm-hmm. telling you, there's still forgiveness for that. Mm-hmm. You're still yes. forgiven. Forgiveness you know, is not dependent upon your depth of sorrow. Exactly. Forgiveness is dependent upon the depth of Christ's grace. And there's no end to that depth. Mm-hmm. And so when, you know, this is them kind of turned in on themselves right. rather than they need to be turned out to focus on the cross. And that's where the power of the absolution really comes in. Right. Is to it, the declarative nature of it, the, proclama- the, the proclamation of, but you're still forgiven. So wherever you want to go with your emotions, I'll go with you as a, mm-hmm. as a pastor, you know, in a pastoral sense. Yeah. But... You're still forgiven. So yes. let's work this through, but you're still forgiven. And, and here's the reality also that, uh, hey, because I encourage my members and I teach on private confession absolution, uh, it behooves me that I ought to be engaging on the other end of private confession absolution. So I have a pastor that I go to on a regular basis to confess and receive absolution. It's a great benefit for me, but it's also a very humbling thing because guess what? I am confessing the same sin just about every time I go. Mm-hmm. Because each one of us has certain sins that we struggle with. Um, Besetting sins is yes. what sometimes called. Yeah, and, and at times it's as if I am so at home in that sin. I've become so accustomed to it. It doesn't shock me the way that it should that how in the world could I do such a thing and do it over and over again? You become it's, numb yeah. or callous. Exactly. And exactly. actually a benefit can be the accountability Right. Of going to someone and... and Here's somebody I'm going to have to name it to. Yeah. I'm going to name it to this pastor. So, you know, but that's very humbling because, yeah, I continue to struggle with it. And a faithful pastor keeps pointing me back to, yes, you struggle with it. Yes, you're comfortable with it. Yes, you don't feel as bad as you should about it. But you are forgiven, not for the sake of your sorrow, but for the sake of Christ. Yeah. Now, we're coming up on our break and we've gotten through one paragraph 
out of 15 <laughs> that I was aiming for to at least be ready today. But uh, that's okay. And the next few paragraphs are going to be really uh, about confession, absolution, the power of the keys, etc. So uh, we'll get to some of this today. We'll see. Uh, we're, you're listening to Concord Matters here on Worldwide KFUO. We'll be back in a moment. Three things make a believer. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Prayer, meditation, and growth. Which is why every weekday morning from 7 to 8 a.m. we bring you Oratio, an hour of solace, contemplation, scripture, sacred music, and faith. Oratio, the dawn breaks with prayer every morning on Worldwide KFUO. I'm World Lutheran News Digest host Kip Allen. Every day, things happen that affect the lives of Lutherans worldwide. Whether it's mercy efforts to a disaster-stricken community, threats to religious liberty, or cultural trends. World Lutheran News Digest takes an in-depth look at one issue each week as I interview newsmakers and experts. All Sarah Gulseth presents a quick look at the week's news. World Lutheran News Digest may be heard every Wednesday at 2.30 and Saturday at 9.30 on Worldwide KFUO. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. You hear our voices every day as we speak the gospel, share the latest news, or for insightful and sometimes entertaining talk. Why not share your voice with us and send us your feedback, suggestions, and questions? Leave your comment at 314-996-1542. Be sure to follow us on social media, too, so you can like, comment, and share your favorite posts. Drop an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or send a snail mail letter to Worldwide KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. Did you know that it was the state of Massachusetts in 1852 that inaugurated the first statewide compulsory school system? By 1918, every state had compulsory attendance laws with the idea that public schools provide a religiously neutral education for students. Horace Mann advocated for compulsory education as the first secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education and is considered the father of American public education. His curriculum featured the Bible as a tool to teach moral character, Judeo-Christian values, and responsible, virtuous citizenship. Mann also believed that the Bible should be taught without doctrine or theology. He said, our system allows it to do what it is allowed to do in no other system, to speak for itself, but here it stops. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. We are back on Concord Matters. we got a lot to get to in this half hour. I'm Pastor Charles Henriksen, your host, and our guests today are to uh, fellow pastors, Mark Sell and Kevin Golden. We're in Article 12b of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, talking about confession and satisfaction. So let's continue on then in uh, paragraphs 2 through 4. I'll read that, and I've got this highlighted in my book of Concord, these paragraphs. Uh, we also keep confession, especially because of the absolution. Absolution is God's word, which, by divine authority, the power of the keys pronounces upon individuals. Therefore, it would be wicked to remove private absolution from the church. If anyone despises private absolution, he does not understand what the forgiveness of sins or the power of the keys is. I think this surprises some people. Don't you think that uh, when we say that Lutherans have retained private confession? I mean, it's in the book of, it's in the uh, Augsburg Confession. We retain private confession. Mm -hmm. And here they're saying, we haven't gotten rid of it. Well, I think we kind of realize how many of our congregations are wicked now. <laughs> <laughs> Including <despise>. mine. <laughs> 
So uh, how do you think that came about? That people, that we get, kind of lost private confession. Well, um, as we mentioned in the previous half hour, this was already the, an issue at the time of Luther, where yeah. as soon as you remove the abuses, especially the obligatory nature the of mandatory. it. The mandatory. Yeah, it's no longer obligatory. You don't have to do this. Well, then people say, then I guess I won't do it. All right? I don't have to do it, so I won't. Mm -hmm. Which is, we don't approach that uh, approach a whole lot of other things with that same attitude. There's plenty of things that it's you kind don't of like, have to do. I'm not required to kiss my wife in order to be married to her, but I still do it because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. I, I appreciate it and such. Uh, I wonder how many of our members realize that we have kept, maybe the thing is only if like you molested a child or committed murder that, that those persons ought to go to private confession, but it doesn't have to be for something that grave or serious pastor self well i i think that's how people how people uh have interpreted this in practice in practice when i hear private confession it usually is something big mm -hmm. it's usually something big where someone will come in and i just have to talk about this as they say they won't with even another talk. man's wife or something yeah, exactly they won't they won't call it private confession absolution, but it's usually those big things that are really bothering them. And a lot of times it's because they remember from confirmation class, the one thing that usually does stick out in their minds is there's a particular sin that's bothering you. Go confess it to your pastor. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes things like that has stuck with people, but it's not a regular practice of going right. to confession. And I think, I think that we've gotten in our culture and in our church body, too, we're not particularly bothered by our sins, right? the run-of-the-mill right. sins. Yeah. They don't particularly bother us as and, much as they ought to. And, and both of you are using kind of the key word, bothers the person, because that's what uh, sends us to private confession is, even though I have confessed the general confession during the divine mm -hmm. service, I've received the forgiveness of all my sin, there is still something that is burdening my troubling conscience. Me. It's troubling me. It's bothering me. And so this is why I go to private confession absolution, so I can speak that sin, receive absolution for that specific sin, that my conscience might be set free and I can live with peace and with joy. Um, so part of the challenge is it's not really necessarily a huge sin, you know, in the way we define sin uh, that needs to send me to confession. It's just whatever's troubling me. So maybe it's that I was, you know, just rather curt with my wife when I shouldn't have mm -hmm. been. That is plenty of reason if that's burdening my conscience. Or if it's it? something that you habitually do that you know you shouldn't do. Right, right. And and then you hit on the, the key thing is... Uh, Hey, we become so callous and accustomed to our sin that things don't trouble us that should trouble or, or us. We, or we just say, well, God's going to forgive. He forgives all my sins. Yeah, and yeah. so therefore. Then it's like a get out of jail free card. Yeah. I think uh, I wonder how uh, how much the lack of preaching the second use of the law properly contributes to this. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, what has always amazed me throughout my ministry is convincing Getting into discussions in the circuit or now here, especially with seminary students, convincing them you've got to condemn sin in your sermon. Yes. Yeah. You know, well, I'm talking about the law. I'm not saying talk about the law. I'm saying, no, condemn the people, who are, sitting, the <laughs> people who are sitting in your pews, send them to hell. Yeah. Condemn them for their sin. Yeah. Identify the sin, condemn it, and then forgive it. And there's such a reluctance to condemn sin because those people are going to pay your salary and vote on your salary exactly <laughs> exactly well i want them and and it's amazing because we all have this as pastors well i do want my people to kind of like me <laughs> and if i call them out for their sin they might not like me as much yeah. and i actually have people say that to me and so i know it's um it, you know every year when i'm going over the new new sermon that gets submitted to me uh, every year, the first uh, have spent about two to two and a half hours with every some student and point out you had a chance to condemn sin here and you didn't. And I, I wish you'd change that. You hit the and microphone they don't want again, it. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I wish you'd change that. And and this long discussion has to take place. Well, you don't really have to condemn sins. And I'm like, why preach? <laughs> you yeah, know? if we don't condemn sin, who will? Exactly. So there's yeah. this abandonment of the second use of the law in, in proclaiming, in preaching, mm -hmm. that gets lost. So want to run with the third use. Always, yeah, right? always. I want to make and them a also, better Christian. Or 
be comfortable with the first use in the sense of let's condemn the world around us because right. we're rather comfortable. If I'm putting the finger in the other guy's chest, you can get a lot of attaboy pastor, go get him pastor. But as soon as the, you know, the pastor is called to put the finger of the law directly into your chest, exactly. condemn you, that's second use and yeah, that, that's uncomfortable. And, and, and I wonder how connected that is, because then if you're not condemning sin on a regular basis in your sermons, then why is there a need for private confession and absolution anyway? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let alone, you know, the general confession right. and absolution I think our, consci- is our down. consciences have been dulled mm-hmm. um, so we don't feel the, our, our sins as much as often as, as we ought. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's move on here. He, he In this section here, he mentions a couple of technical terms here. Absolution and the power of the keys. Why don't you take one of those terms and one take the other? What is absolution? What is the power of the keys? Take well, a turn. The, the power of the keys is uh, just take um, the thought of how you can get that through that door if it's locked. You need some keys to get through that door. So the power of the keys is the keys that unlock the door to salvation. And those keys are, you have to be holy and perfect to get into heaven. Well, how do I do that? Forgiveness. You need the pure forgiveness that Christ has earned for you. And it's that forgiveness that becomes the keys that get you into heaven. And so the power of the keys is to forgive sins. And then how does that forgiveness come to us? And then that leads us into the means of grace. The term, the power of the keys, sometimes uh, translated as the office of the keys. And Pastor Golden, we talk about the binding key and the loosing yes. key. What is yes. that? That's from the words of Jesus. Yep, this comes right out of Matthew 16, where Jesus talks about the, the keys of the kingdom. They bind and they loose. So the loosing is, uh, this is a wonderful uh, description. What sin does is it clings to us. But in holy absolution, with the forgiveness of our sin, sin is loosed from us. It's gone. It's no longer clinging to us. But when our impenitence leads us to continue, uh, well, essentially to refuse Christ's gift defend of forgiveness. Defend ourselves. Defend ourselves and such. That's essentially us telling Jesus, you can't have this sin, I'm keeping it for myself. And that's when uh, Christ has entrusted this authority to his church, and then the church in, on behalf uh, then also uh, calls a pastor to do this. Your sins is, are retained upon yes, you. They're it's locked bound you. upon you. So yeah, now you are burdened by that sin because you are impenitent. And that's this is the key thing, is repentance. The key thing, very yes, good. Yes, the key thing. <laughs> Oh, didunch. Uh So repentance. It is repentance that uh, allows the sin to be loosed. But impenitence, when I refuse to say, Christ, you can have this sin, but I want to keep it for myself, now is why the sin is bound, uh, sin is bound upon So me. what we're aiming for is the loosing key. I, right. think, I think of our sins kind of like if you saw like a Christmas carol or something where there's this specter with these rattling, these chains, chains rattling yeah. on them, locked on them. So... Uh, to loose those chains from off your shoulder, the the chains of sin off from off your shoulders, and to be set free from that burden. That's what we're aiming for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, how does that tie in? What is absolution, Pastor Cell? Well, it's the declaration of the forgiveness of sins. It's actually removing the sins from you by the proclamation. Uh, the absolution in the public context of the church service and the divine service it's as you noted earlier that's where the pastor in the stead and by the command of my lord jesus christ i forgive you all your sins you're actually releasing the forgiveness of sins it's the from authoritative the and effective word of forgiveness it does what it says it will do and that's how the lord does things he always does it by his word his word does what it says so that everything from creation let there mm-hmm. be light and there's light uh to hey the resurrection of Lazarus. How does uh, Lazarus come back to life? Come out. No CPR. It's just Jesus speaks the word and it happens. This Jesus' is... words are living and active and do what they say. Exactly. And so that's the same thing here. This is the Lord's word doing what it says. Very good. All right, let's try to get a little... Well, let fr- me ask fr- one more question. So then, because um, this comes up with people. So then, can, are pastors the only one who could absolve? Publicly in the church, what yes. would you say? Yeah, uh, so this the authority to forgive for sins has been entrusted to the church. So the church as a whole has this authority. Uh, now, on a public setting, the church entrusts that, entrusts that to the called pastor to do that. But in a private setting, any Christian can do it so that um, 
Mark, when you go home and you tell your wife, oh boy, I was out of line doing X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. your uh, blessed wife can speak forgiveness to you. And it's Christ's forgiveness because she's a member of the church. So in a private setting, any Christian can do it. But also there's great benefit to going to your pastor for that, uh, a host of reasons. One of them is because he's called for that very reason. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's why he's been put into the pastoral office. Also because one of the things that a pastor will do is in order to help um, address the burden upon this person's conscience is drawing from the word of God to apply to that so that here is the word of God that comes to you and speaks of who you are because you have been forgiven in Christ, that you are a new creation, that your conscience is clean, etc. The pastor ought to be the most apt and yeah. and know the scriptures the best and yeah. which scriptures well it's his job you know, it's like a doctor <laughs> yes. a doctor may a, a layman may be able to help you with this or that injury but a doctor has has gone years to know exactly has what is the best treatment to but apply. at the same time we wouldn't want to say i mean we we would not want to fall into the trap to say that so you know jim and john jim you forgive your brother mm-hmm. You can forgive you. You can say, yes. you say, I forgive you. I yeah. forgive you for your sin. And that'll come and up later in this section in, in, in paragraph 12, which we will not get to today. It talks about this mutual uh, confession, about confessing your sins to one another, particularly when you have hurt somebody else. Yes. And, and uh, especially in premarital counseling, when I'm working with young couples or not so young couples at times that are getting ready to uh, be married, this is something that I go over quite a bit is uh, some of the most critical words that you have to become accustomed to saying within your marriage are i am sorry and then fill in the blank why are you sorry i'm sorry that i was short with you i'm sorry that i didn't listen or whatever it might be and then please forgive me please forgive me and then the you also have to get accustomed to the other end of that saying i forgive forgive you." you and recognize that you're not only speaking your personal forgiveness which is critical but also you are speaking on behalf of christ within the marriage uh to deliver forgiveness. It's the beauty of being Lutheran because it's always both and. Okay. <laughs> Let me read uh, paragraphs 5 through 8 here to finish out this uh, uh, section. Um, regarding the complete listing of offenses and confession, we have said above that we hold that it is not necessary by divine right. Some object to this, saying that a judge should investigate a case before he rules on it, which has nothing to do with this subject. The ministry of absolution is favor or grace. It is not a legal process or law. Ministers in the church have the command to forgive sin. They do not have the command to investigate secret sins. Indeed, they absolve us from those sins that we do not remember. For that reason, absolution, which is the voice of the gospel, forgiving sins and comforting consciences, does not require judicial examination. And in the, let me just do uh, paragraph 9 because it's the same sort of thing here. Uh, it is ridiculous to apply to this discussion the saying of Solomon, know well the condition of your flocks, Proverbs twenty seven twenty three, for Solomon says nothing about confession. He gives to the father of a family a domestic precept that he should use what is his own and refrain from what is another's. Solomon commands the father to take good care of his own property, yet he should do so in such a way that with his mind occupied with the increase of his resources, he should not cast away the fear of God or faith or care in God's word. But our adversaries, by a wonderful change, transform scripture passages to whatever meaning they please. Here, to know means to them hearing confession, means to them hearing confessions, the condition, not the outward life, but the secrets of conscience. And your flocks means people. The interpretation is truly neat and is worthy of these haters of pursuing eloquence. If anyone desires to transfer by analogy a precept from a father of a family to a pastor of a church, he should certainly interpret the condition as applying to the outward life. This comparison will be more consistent. All right. What this is getting at is a couple of things. Is a complete listing of offenses. What's wrong with a complete listing of offenses, either one of you? On one hand, I can't list everything. I'm I'm oblivious to many of my sins. And so there's this wonderful statement in there back in paragraph 8. Indeed, pastors absolve us from those sins that we 
do not remember, all right? And uh, that's especially within the uh, general confession on Sunday morning, uh, where I just confess, hey, I, I'm a big sinful mess. I got a lot out there and such. Um, and this is where it is so wonderful that we do confess the omniscience of God, that God knows everything, including he knows all those sins of which I am ignorant. I didn't even notice them. I Maybe I'm at a point where I am not yet well learned in scripture enough to realize that was a sin by uh, in what I did and but God knows and he forgives me for so this that. is over against the Roman requirement of the complete enumeration the yes. complete listing of sins. you got to name them all for them to or be you forgiven. can't be sure yes. now pastor Sal is it wrong when you go to confession to list some offenses no of course not um, and you can list the offenses that are bothering you yeah. And identify those. Uh, and it's also helpful to think about, so which commandments are I bre- did I break? Which yeah. one does this break? Now you, what, that, you know? That's good. I'm glad you brought that up because he talks here about this complete examination, this uh, judicial examination, which the Roman priests were doing, this uh, sort of uh, litig- legal investigation, um, right. which went too far because they were trying to probe your conscience. Mm-hmm. Um well, I, but I, you can do a, a helpful examination, I think, and this comes up later. But at the there same time, you don't you don't want to turn the church into having torture. to. Uh, well, you don't you don't even want to have to give people the idea that well, you know, we're going to send the church police to your door, mm-hmm. yeah, and we're going to investigate just how you know how sinful you've been. Um, I know you're not living together, but did you spend the night over the weekend when you were, or when you guys went on a trip with your family? Where did you sleep? Uh, you know, you to get into, I'm not going to investigate your life. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's up to you to know and, and to repent of your sins and mm-hmm. enumerate them on your own. And there is no role for church police in church. Right. Mm-hmm. But there will be times where pastor will ask some questions as part of the private confession. Sure. Uh, and that's usually occasioned by a, a sense that what is being confessed here... There's something more behind that. Right. We need to get not, we don't want to stay with just the surface symptom. We need to get to the deeper diagnosis of what is actually uh, troubling the conscience so that that can be what is absolved. Otherwise, if all we deal with the surface, there isn't going to be actual lasting comfort and uh, cleansing of the conscience. So he com- it says here about what, where they were wrongly comparing the pastor to the father of a family or the shepherd of a flock. Is there a right way in which a pastor is like the father of a family? What he's saying is we don't probe secret con- secrets of conscience, but how should a pastor know his congregation like a father knows his family? I think it's, um, I, I, this is the art of pastoral care. Uh, you know what I mean? Where you, uh, you can't enumerate what a, a pastor has to do, but there's that fatherly wisdom and knowledge to kind of know where it might be going mm-hmm. to, as you, Kevin, just brought up those moments where you heard someone confess, but you know, there's a little bit more. So you follow up with some questions just to give them a chance to get it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like when the kid comes home and, you know, they're half hour late, but it being a half hour late wasn't really the problem. There's something else going on with your kids. Yeah. So I'm Why going to go beyond that. Early. Right, yeah. exactly. I'm going to go beyond that and talk to them about it. And mm-hmm. that's the, the, the art of pastoral care, the fatherly art that comes in to try to probe and get a little bit of information so that you can be absolved, so that I could help you, so that we okay. could talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Well, and this is why I would say um, pastors need to visit. You know, they need to know their members so that just like I need to know my biological children um, so that I can then have a read on them. I can tell something's not right with this son or this daughter and I need to see what's going on to help them through it. Hey, you need to know your flock, your congregation, because then you can kind of pick up this member is not in their isn't this isn't how they normally act and how they normally speak something's going on here so you follow up with them and you may find out that hey there is a sin that's burdening them or you might find out that they're exceedingly worried because they just found out mom is got terminal cancer whatever it might be all right and it's amazing how many times when you get into the home and you let the conversation unfolds and, and unfold and then the husband or a, a child starts talking about something and then all of a sudden the picture kind of comes together and right. then you're more understanding to what this 
mother or this wife or this husband is going through mm-hmm. and and so you kind of uh you're more careful with your words <laughs> yeah. you know what yep. i mean yes yep let me see if we can get through paragraphs 10 through 12 in the five minutes or so we have left paragraph 10 let us skip such matters as these confession is mentioned at t- different times in the psalms I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, verse 5. Such confession of sin, which is made to God, is contrition itself. When confession is made to God, it must be made with the heart, not only with the voice, like actors on the stage. Confession is contrition in which, feeling God's anger, we confess that God is justly angry and that he cannot be reconciled by our works. Yet we seek for mercy because of God's promise, such is the following confession. Against you, you only, have I sinned, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Psalm 51, verse 4. This means, I confess that I am a sinner and have merited eternal wrath. Nor can I set my righteousnesses, my merits, against your wrath. So I declare that you are just when you condemn and punish us. I declare that you are clear when hypocrites judge you to be unjust in punishing them or in condemning the well-deserving. Yes, our merits cannot satisfy your judgment, but we will be justified in this way, namely, if you justify us, if you through your mercy, if, if through your mercy you count us righteous. Perhaps someone may also cite James 5.16, confess your sins to one another. But here the reference is not to confession made to priests, but is the reconciliation of brothers to each other. Confession should be mutual. We talked about that a couple of moments ago. When we sin against one another, it's appropriate to go and confess that to your brother and he speak a word of forgiveness. But here it's talking about the central truth of the Christian faith, about justification and how we are made righteous with God. And uh, so we're confessing, I can't do it by my own works. You are justified, God, in condemning me as a sinner. Mm -hmm. So is there any hope for us? It says here, but we will be justified in this way, namely, if you justify us, if through your mercy you count us righteous. Pastor Golden, how does God justify us? He does it in his son, very specifically, uh, that the just demands of the law have not been met by me, but they have been met by Christ. And so he takes... Uh, my sin, puts it on his son, takes the son's fulfillment of the law, puts it upon me. So this is uh, part of what happens even in absolution, that my sin is stripped of me, and instead I have his righteousness. Pastor Sell, elaborate on that. Yeah, and, and it, it's, it, it is so comforting to the person to realize your sin now as far as the east is from the west. Your sin is as far as the heavens are above the earth. Psalm 103. Is, exactly. And and so pure forgiveness means it doesn't belong to you, you know, and you want you you bring a person into an understanding that it's no longer his because Christ paid for it. He paid for this sin. Let Christ enjoy his not let, let Christ pay for that sin and take that sin from you. So the pure absolution allows a person to understand that you are pure and holy. You are as white as the snow, you, the robes of Christ's righteousness, the picture of heaven. That's who you are. The saints gathered around the throne, the rejoicing in the presence of the lamb who took your sins away from you. And that constant repetitious repetition of you're forgiven you're forgiven you're forgiven in the many different ways that uh, the bible presents it so that you know there you have you have no way for you to hang on to your sin because christ paid for it luther would call this the blessed exchange or the happy mm-hmm. exchange exactly. i think it's something like freilich uh, my, my german's a little rusty freilich weckels uh, or something like that uh, christ takes your sins He paid for them. He took them in his body on the cross and his holy blood covers and cleanses all your sins because he's the son of God dying for all the sinners of the world. And in exchange, he puts into your bank account with God all of his righteous keeping of the law, his righteousness. So uh, uh, he takes your sins. You get his righteousness. That's a pretty sweet deal. Doesn't get any sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the beauty, again, to relate it to something that we all do here. It's the comfort of the gospel message in baptism. 
daily dying and rising again with Christ. So yes. my life is crucified in Christ, and I get to rise again in the baptism. Brand new, clean, perfect, holy. The resurrection then is not just for the day I died. The resurrection is every moment and every day of my life as the baptized, resurrected child of God continues to take each and every step and get done what he or she needs to get done in life. And confession is a return to that baptism. The big thing in confession is not you've got some sins to confess. whoop de doo we all do. The big thing is the absolution, God's freeing word of forgiveness in Christ. And that is for you. Dear listener, you've been listening to Concord Matters here on Worldwide KFUO.